Did you ever have the chance to look at a surgical or anatomical specimen of the mitral valve? Did you ever look at the chordal structures and see how fragile they actually look? One would actually assume that we have a higher incidence of flay leaflets. Nevertheless, several things have to happen that a chordal structure actually ruptures and that we have a flay leaflet. We'll talk about these factors and how it affects the mitral valve and how we diagnose it with echo in the following chapter. A flay leaflet is defined as a partial rupture of the mitral valve or of chordal structures. So it's not the same thing as a papillary muscle rupture. Nevertheless, a flay leaflet has a bad prognosis. This is from a landmark study published 1996 in the New England Journal of Medicine and it shows you the natural history of patients who have a flay leaflet. After 10 years, 63% have heart failure, 30% have atrial fibrillation, and 90% have either died or had to undergo cardiac surgery. Here's such an example which clearly explains why it is a problem. We have a leaflet which freely prolapses into the left atrium and which is detached from the papillary muscle and thereby you can imagine the patient must have a severe form of mitral regurgitation and most patients with flay leaflet do have significant mitral regurgitation. However, not all patients have significant mitral regurgitation. To explain this, here is a diagram which shows you the mitral valve and the different sites where rupture can occur. If we have a rupture of the papillary muscle or the head of a papillary muscle, we have a lot of chordal structures which are involved and a large portion of the valve will be detached. Therefore, obviously, mitral regurgitation will be severe. However, we can also have the situation where only a small secondary cord is involved, which is not really involved in holding the rim of the leaflet, but more the body, and thereby we might only have a very minor region which is involved and only a very insignificant form of mitral regurgitation. We can also have primary chordal structures involved, then we have more involvement of mitral regurgitation. So, in summary, it depends very much on where the site of rupture actually is. What are the types of cords good for? Well, the primary cords are important for the early tightening phase, the phase when systole starts and the mitral valve is pressed shut, while the secondary cords are more load relievers. So they hold the valve. Imagine a parachute at the moment when the parachute opens, it would be the primary cords and then the secondary cords hold the parachute while you sail down to earth. The papillary muscle, of course, are the anchor. Why do cords rupture? Well, it can happen spontaneous, even in completely normal valves. More frequently, however, it does occur in the setting of mitral valve prolapse, specifically in the myxomatous type of mitral valve prolapse. Why? because these cords have less strength. They are also affected by the disease. If you have endocarditis, it can also involve the subvalvular apparatus and thereby lead to rupture of chordal structures. And same is true for degenerative disease. With aging, the cords get weaker. This is also the case in rheumatic heart disease. Remember, in the chapter on mitral valve prolapse, I mentioned that usually it is not the entire valve which is involved, but only parts. Same is true for flay leaflet. Here we have the typical classification of the mitral valve with respect to the different regions. This is the classification which was proposed by Carpentier. What do we have? We have the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. And both leaflets are divided into the anterolateral, the medial, and the posterior medial portion. So we have A1, which is the anterolateral scallop of the mitral valve. A2, which is the medial scallop of the anterior leaflet, and A3, which is the posterior medial scallop of the mitral valve. Same is true for the posterior leaflet. In addition, we also have a commissural region, the anterolateral commissure and the posterior medial commissure. For a surgeon, it's not only important that he knows that a flay leaflet is present, but he also needs to know where the problem is. 
we can actually do this with echocardiography. This will be discussed in more detail when we talk about the mechanism of mitral regurgitation. But now I want to show you a typical patient where we have to find out if he really has a flay leaflet. So it's not always easy to differentiate uh, normal mitral valve prolapse from a patient who also has a flare leaflet. So the detection of a flare leaflet can sometimes be very challenging. Let's take a look at our patient if we can actually see a flare leaflet. This is the peristernal long axis view. You can see that the patient has mitral valve prolapse, especially of the posterior leaflet, but we do not really see any portions of the valve which appear to be flail. But what you can do is you can tilt the transducer back and forth and try to find the region where the flail supposedly is. But again, I would not make the diagnosis from this view. So the peristernal approach in this patient did not help us very much. So we'll turn to the apical view. Again, we see the prolapse, but what we see immediately is we see that there are very small portions of the valve which are parallel to the anterior leaflet, behind the anterior leaflet in the left atrium, and which show a very fine fluctuating motion caused by the regurgitant jet. We can even put an M mode inside here, and we can display the flail portion of the posterior leaflet. So this parallel position of the flail leaflet is a very good sign in addition to severe forms of flail leaflet where you have a concave contour of the leaflet towards the left atrium. This can also be seen very nicely here in the apical long axis view where you have a portion of the valve which is in parallel to the posterior leaflet. These patients also have very often have very eccentric jets so this also helps you in the diagnosis even though it's not indicative you do need the 2D image to make the diagnosis of a flare leaflet. So the image quality and your ability to create good images is crucial to make the diagnosis of a flare leaflet especially if they are very discrete, as you can see here in this example on your left. There's only a very small portion. You could actually miss this very easy. Here is an example which you should not miss in any case. Very good image quality, and you can clearly see that a large portion of the mitral valve is prolapsing and also ruptured. You can see the ruptured chordal structures right here in the left atrium. Here are three echo criteria which I find valuable. Look for chordal structures in the left atrium, concave position of the leaflet towards the left atrium, and a double contour, the anterior here in this example, in front of the posterior. Where could you have a differential diagnostic problem? Well, in the setting of endocarditis or suspected endocarditis. What do you think? Is this a flay leaflet or is this a vegetation? It could be both as well. Why? Because patients who have myxomatous valves or flay leaflets also have a higher risk of endocarditis. And remember, endocarditis could cause a flay leaflet. So very difficult to say. What is your opinion on this case? Here again, a structure on the mitral valve or is this a part of the mitral valve? Well, the answer, this is a vegetation, this is endocarditis, and here, this is a patient who had endocarditis and who now has a flay leaflet. Here we had very high infectious parameters, and this patient had a normal C-reactive protein. So you see, a flay leaflet can look quite different from patient to patient. If you want to see more cases, don't forget to go to our Atlas section. We have numerous cases in there. And also don't forget to go to our chapter on the mechanism of MR because there we'll discuss how a flay leaflet affects the direction of the jets.